The Midnight Fox by Betsy Byers, dramatized by Judith Adams. When something happens to change the world forever, it never happens how you thought it would, or where, or when. And is it the world changing anyway, or just you? I used to plan the way my whole life would change someday. It would always be to do with me being clever, or brave, or famous, special, you know? Right at the center. Like, I used to think, if I could just discover one thing in my life, it would be a brand new color no one's ever seen before. And here's how I thought it would be. I'd be digging in my backyard, and I'd get this feeling something was about to happen. I dig faster and faster, my heart pumping my throat, my fingers flashing in the soft black dirt, and suddenly I'd stop and put my hands up to my eyes because there in the earth, in the black earth, would be a ball, a perfectly round mass of this new color. I'd go into the house where my parents are sitting watching TV. I've discovered a new color. That's nice, dear. Uh, hush up, son. It's the baseball report. Sure. Ladies and gentlemen, do not try to adjust the color on your sex. Tonight, history has been made. From tonight, nothing in the world will ever be the same again. You see right before your eyes a new color, discovered only today by this ordinary young boy. I'd come on screen holding the ball I had dug from the earth and... Tommy! Son! And then... All around the world, a silence would occur. The only silence that had ever fallen upon the whole world at one time. Eskimos would pause with pieces of dried fish halfway to their mouths. Russians, who had run in from the cold, would stop beating the snow from their arms. Indians, with their spears poised behind their ears, ready to throw at a leopard, would freeze and... But life doesn't work that way. There's some on the farm I found out. When something happens to change everything, it's never what you thought would happen. And when it happens, it happens so fast, and there's so many other people it's happening to, you can't control it. You can only react. One way or another. It's been five years since that night. The lightning flashes, the midnight world turns white for a split second, and I see everything as it was the last time, that last terrible night. Five years since the summer of the midnight fox, and I still hear her above the rain, beyond the years. The trouble with you, Tommy, is that you don't try to like new things. Mom, you shouldn't have to try to like new things. You should just very easily, without even thinking about them, sort of sidle up to them and like them, you know? Oh, Tommy, it's my first chance. Maybe my only chance. Don't you want your father and me to have this trip? Yes. Oh, you're not acting like it. I want you to have the trip, okay? I want you to have a hundred trips, just as long as I don't have to go to any dumb farm. You make it sound like a punishment. You aren't a baby anymore, Tom. Be reasonable. I am. Animals hate me. Mom looks at me. Then she goes inside and turns up the TV. Then I don't hear her call Dad up on the phone. Then I don't hear her crying, but I do. My mom cries easily. Only my best friend, Petey Burkis, understood where I was coming from on this. You know? Yeah. I tell you, animals don't like me. Yeah? Perfectly strange animals see me, and they just charge right at me. Yeah? All the time. Wow. I tell you, I'll be the only kid in the world stampeded to death by a bunch of fluffy lambs. Petey's transferring this ant from one sneaker to the other, crossing his legs all sorts of different ways. See this ant, Tom? He's thinking, wow, there are a thousand boys in sneakers lined up here, and I will never, 
never, never get to the end of them. The whole of the rest of my life's going to be stomping up a mountain range of sneakers. I will never see my wife and kids again. It wouldn't be so bad if you were coming with me. Yeah, I saw this TV show about a farm one time, and this city kid comes to live on the farm. And gets trampled? Gets lost. So what happens? Well, fortunately for this city kid, Lassie lives on this farm. So somebody says, go find him, Lassie. Go find the little lost city kid. Did she? Well, I switched channels myself. I guess I'll be lost on the farm. But I think it's a pretty safe guess she did. And there won't be any real smart dog to come find me. Yeah, probably some other kind of animal. Like a real smart horse. Or a real smart pig. Boy rescued from death by pig. Petey was going to be a reporter. I write stories. In my head. That's different from reporting on what happens. It's reporting on what might happen. Which is sometimes better and sometimes a whole lot worse. I wish I could see a farm. You don't either, Petey Burkus. You'll probably get neat chores, like milking the cow. Will you write to me? You sound like you're going to the penitentiary. I wish he hadn't said that thing. Yeah, about milking a cow. I started a story in my head where my relations would think I was some athlete with muscles like potatoes who could toss hay into the loft without spilling a straw. And as the car draws up at the farm, I hear them sing. Now we have someone to break the wild horses for us. Now we have someone to get the boulders out of North 40. And I'd step out and they'd cry, But, but where, where is, is the, the big boy? boy? I'm the only boy there is. And they'd try to hide their disappointment. But finally... But he's so puny, friend. Mm, looks more like a girl, Millie. Oh, no! Now, look what you've done. Petey, write me. Sure, and you'd better answer. I will. There'll be nothing else to do. Are you crazy? Farms are busy, busy all the time. They'll work you like a horse. Kid dies of overwork at Uncle's farm. Your dad's home. I have to go now, Tom. Hi, sir. Afternoon, Petey. You heading home? Bye, sir. Bye, Tom. Well, you shouldn't feel he needs to call me sir. You're the sports coach. Yeah, out of school. I'm just your dad. <sighs> oh, where's Mom's your mom? Inside. Crying? Yeah, I guess. Uh-huh. <clears throat> um, Tommy. I know, I know. Son, this trip means a lot to your mother. I want her to go to Europe and see everything she wanted to see all her life. Me too. I want her to go. I want you both to go. I just... And I don't want her to be worried about you the whole time. Here's where you play in the team or you don't play in the team, son. Dad never understood why I didn't want to be in Little League. Not even after he'd watched me strike out 17 times straight. He used to go on about it sometimes. About needing a fierce desire to play. As in sport, so in life, is his favorite motto. As long as she thinks you don't want to go to the farm, the farm, I may say, she has always loved, <sighs> she is going to worry. But I don't want to go. For once in your life, you could think of someone beside yourself. My dad also likes to talk about control. He said control was the most important thing there was to an athlete. And I should have more of it. Are you crying, Tom? My nose is running. Okay. All right. I want to go to the farm. Now was the time for him to say fine and walk away. But my dad never knew how to make an exit like in the movies. He always hung around. <clears throat> you won't be sorry, son. Go with the right attitude and two months on a farm can make a world of difference to a boy your age. Mentally and physically. I wanted to say I like myself the way I am. But if my own dad wanted me to be a whole world different, who was I to say I liked the way I was? You're doing a fine thing for your mother, Tom. Besides, right then and there, 
I didn't like the way I was. <laughs> same old story. <laughs> I am so excited. Sweetheart, you look 15. <laughs> you know my favorite thing at the farm, Tom? Getting the X. Putting my hand under a warm hen and finding treasure and running back to the house with it for breakfast. <laughs> Why do they say these things? Right away in my story, I'm running back to the house with my egg. And there's this noise behind me. Like a freight train. I look around and it gets louder and louder and louder. And 200 chickens run me down. The boss hand snatches the egg back from my mangled hand. And they all march back in triumph to the coop. Animals hate me. Nonsense. Millie says they got baby pigs. I'll bet you can have one. I've always wanted a baby pig. Hey, good going, son. Hey. I guess you couldn't expect people who are going to do Europe on bicycles to appreciate sarcasm. There she is. There she is. Oh, it's been so long. And it's all exactly the same. You want to come on back in the house and have some more lemonade? No thanks, Aunt Millie. You want me to show you the farm? No thanks, Uncle Fred. Oh, he's tired, Fred. Been a long trip. You just laze around, Tom. It's so hot. Now, where is that hazel eye? I told her to be here. All my boys have up and flown now, Tom, and hazel has got a bow, so she'll leave the nest soon. I'm so glad to have a youngster around the place again. Thanks, Aunt Millie. <laughs> well, don't get into any mischief now. Oh, Fred. I want Uncle Fred. Thanks. You'd like to get unpacked. I never thought of that till this minute. <laughs> Come on. Uh, I've got your cousin Bubba's room all ready for you. <laughs> it's a real boy's room. My cousin Bubba's room is a museum to the real boy, all right. A shotgun on the rack, a stuffed squirrel on the bookcase with a host of bird's eggs and stolen nests instead of books. Not a person in the world could have thought that I belonged to that room. Now, just you look here. <laughs> I've been at Fred all week to hammer these screens in. Come see. That's our old oak tree. The boys just loved it. See those smooth spots on the branches? That's the way Bubba and Fred got up and down. They wouldn't use the stairs for anything. When I heard you were coming, I said to Fred, You nail those screens now. I'm too old to worry myself into a sweat about boys falling out of trees. I won't <laughs> climb out, Aunt Millie. Oh, go along with you. I know boys. I'm afraid of heights. Aunt Millie? Yes, Tom? Is it always this quiet here? quiet. Well, I guess. It's partly the weather, you know. Real heavy weather we're having. Rain would be good. Gets me down, the heat. Your mom said you like books. Uh, we have some in the glass case down under the stairs. Uh, my boys weren't much for reading. Don't worry. <laughs> You come for supper now and uh, yeah, choose yourself a book on the way. The glass case down under the stairs was full of the sort of books I hated. But Aunt Millie was watching, so I grabbed one called The Lamb Who Thought He Was a Cat. All I could feel was, why do people have to write books like that? Someone wishing he was someone else he could never, ever be in his whole life? Just thinking about that lamb wanting to climb trees he could never climb made me feel awful. Well, look who showed up. She knows when the food's on the table, I guess. Mm -hmm. Hi, Cousin Tom. I'm Hazeline. <laughs> Bubba and Fred Jr. together once ate 23 halves of my pimento cheese sandwiches <laughs> in one sitting. Bubba and Fred Jr. are pigs. Oh. Mm, pass the potato, Dad. Uh, yeah, here you go. Those first three days on the farm were the longest, slowest days of my life. There seemed to be nothing moving at all, not air, 
not time. Even the giant bees seemed to kind of hang in the air. I picked up my food. I, I didn't sleep much. I had nothing to say. I did a lot of just standing around those first days. Oh, oh my goodness, Tom. You gave me a scare. I didn't even hear you come in. You on your way somewhere? I'm going to check the mailbox, Aunt Millie. Outside, Uncle Fred was preparing for his ritual daily dive in the pond. Standing on the veranda in his shorts, towel over his shoulder, waiting for the moment. Well, boy, how's it going? Fine, Uncle Fred. He ran till he was at the very edge of the pond and then sort of launched. He was halfway out across the water before... My one big dread, since it seemed I didn't have to milk cows or collect eggs or in any way add my muscle to the running of the farm, my one big big dread was some evening I would have to go swimming with Uncle Fred and Cousin Hazeline would photograph it. Boy drowns. Girl photographs it. The only fun I had was writing this stuff to Petey and getting his letters. Yes! I always took Petey's letters to a special place I found over the hill by the creek where no one would disturb me. There were trees so big I couldn't get my arms around them. And soft grass and rocks to sit on. I got to like this place a lot. Dear Tom, nothing much happening here. Went to the playground Saturday and fell down the steep bank by the swings. Some girls laughed. Boy falls while girls cheer. Not much else happened. Do you get chiller theater? There was a real good movie on Saturday night about mushroom men. Write me a letter. P.D. Burkus. P.S. I'm inventing a questionnaire. Dear P.D., I do not know whether we get to a theater or not. Since there is no TV set here, it is hard to know what we could get if we had one. Write me a letter. Tom. I just looked up while I wondered what P.S. I would write. And I saw the black fox. She was leaping over where the grass was very green. She stopped. She stared at the grass a while. And then she sprang, both front paws together. But it was just the wind she caught. So she flicked her head to one side like a sort of shrug. And then she ran straight for me. I didn't move at all. But I could hear the paper in my hand shaking, and my heart seemed to have moved up in my body, far as my throat. In all my life, I had never been so excited. I wanted to shout. Aunt Millie, a fox, look. That's nice, dear. Eat up your beans. Uncle Fred, come see this. It's a fox, a black fox. There's no such thing as a black fox, son. You've been dreaming. It's the heat, dear. P.S. P.D. Today I saw a black fox. So what else is happening? She ran straight for the grove of trees where I was sitting. Until she was close enough for me to see her black fur tipped with white. Like the moon was shining on a midsummer afternoon and frosting it. Then she stopped. She was ten feet away. And the wind must have suddenly changed because she got my scent. She looked right at me, with her pale green golden eyes and great black fur ruffling in the wind. She stared at me. I stared at her. She wasn't afraid, but with a bound lighter than the wind on the crest of the grass, she was gone. Right then, I wanted to turn the movie back and repeat over and over and over the picture of that fox leaping over the grass toward me. Hazelon? Turn the wick up, Tom. The moths are burning themselves. Look. How do you like that dress? It's all right. <laughs> You're thinking it would look awful on me. I am too 
fat for everything. I think you're just right. I think people who like to eat are real lucky. You would think there was never such a thing as a fat bride. Look at these skinny things. Line. I wish I could pick at my food like you do. Thirty minutes after supper and I'm already hungry again. Do you have many wild animals around here? Oh, no. You don't have to worry about that. No deer? Foxes? That sort of stuff? Sure. Deer, foxes, squirrels, muskrat. Oh, look at her! She never ate a thing in her life. She'll blow away on the church steps. Hazelon, do you see many foxes in the wood? Do you want to go hunting? Just tell Daddy. He's never happier than when he's walking through the woods with a gun. Do people trap around here or anything? No. Nobody I know does any trapping, and unless it's because an animal gets to be a bother, you know. Messes the garden, steals chickens. Then what do they do? <sighs> See that car headlight coming over the rise? I bet it's that boyfriend of mine. Hide this. He mustn't see my dress, not even a picture. Hazeline, what do they do for an animal, you know? Actually, about two weeks ago, there was a fox stealing the hunter chickens. You know that farm back along the road? Usually a fox won't take chickens, except when he's got a family of little foxes. Oh. What did Mr. Hunter do? Foxes are tricky. Real tricky. So Mr. Hunter got real tricky, too. He put a piece of raw meat out in the middle of the stream on a little island that the fox couldn't reach. Well, now, there's that boyfriend of mine at last. <laughs> yeah, but go on about the fox. Well, you were just so late getting here that I went and got myself a new boyfriend, Mikey Galter. Mmm, you look mighty good. Go oh, on about the fox, <laughs> Hazelon. Mr. Mm. Hunter put the raw chicken on the island so the fox couldn't reach it. My and... granddaddy. Now, he was one who could get foxes. He used to squeak them up. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> hey, Zlein, what happened to Mr. Hunter's fox? Okay, well, he put some moss in the stream, like a stepping stone, see? Only underneath the moss was an open trap. And that very night, the fox came by, saw the raw chicken, and put his foot right on the moss and sprung the trap. Bingo! <laughs> Oh. And then he found the dam, went and got a stick of dynamite and blew it up. And I guess that was the end of the mother and her babies. We're going to sit here all night talking vermin and we're going for a drive. <laughs> See you later, Tommy. I sat there a minute. It was one of those stories you're sorry afterwards you made somebody tell you. Tom? Huh? Yes, Aunt Millie? You're not reading in the dark, are you? Ruining your eyes. Adults. Always worrying about the wrong things. One time, Petey's babysitter came out, and Petey was stuck up in this tree, about to fall. And she said, Petey, come down out of that wind. You're going to get the earache. He made up a headline about it. Boy breaks 27 bones. Avoids earache. I thought it had been hard enough waiting for Petey's letters. But now, I really had to learn what waiting was about. The second time I saw her was a Tuesday, four days later. I was almost asleep in the heat by the creek. And the green of the field that day was golden green. Greener than I can ever remember. I was lying on a rock, watching the birds circling the ravine, skimming the air for insects, thinking... That's what we meant when we said we wanted to fly. She floated down from the crest of the hill, never seeing me, then crouched, watching the grass, then delicately pounced like a dancer in a light, graceful movement, and then raised her head, and I saw a mouse between her jaws. That was the second time. third time, I know she saw me. I just laid down on a rock when she called. I looked up, saw her across the creek, and got up quickly and let her lead me into the forest. She seemed to keep calling me to hurry, hurry, and I started to run past the ravine on through the trees, certain she needed me, and my heart swelled up in my chest. 
I kept running. I didn't mind the heat at all. Then, everything went quiet. And I'd lost her. She'd abandoned me. I waited. I was getting real good at waiting. But in the end, I had to go back. And the only way back to the farm from that side of the wood was through the cow field. Cows do not attack people. Cows do not attack people. Cows do not attack people. At this point, one of the cows took a step in my direction, and I ran. Cow attacks boy. Scientists baffled. Hazel. Well, what on earth's eating you? I was, I was just running. There's something after you? No. Oh, well, thought maybe you'd stirred up an old bear or something running in this heat. Help me fold this sheet. Hazel, nothing's drying. The air's just like a steam room. Follow the fox into the woods. Why did I say that? Did you put these in the basket? The fox. She acted like she wanted me to follow her. She? How did I know she was a she? But she was. I knew it. Yeah. She took me somewhere, then disappeared. Why was I telling her my secret? You were probably near her den, and she wanted to lead you off. Oh. That is the oldest trick in the world. It'll fool a dog every time. Next time a fox invites you for a walk, look round where you are, and you might just see yourself some baby foxes. Oh. Why is it there's always a lone sock? It looked like it was a black fox. Oh? Can you see another sock this color? This is why I could talk to Hazeline. Stuff poured through her. Then she'd forget it. Have you ever seen a black fox, Hazeline? Oh, saw one on a rich lady one time in the pew in front. Fur that thick. I kept putting my hand out to stroke the lady's coat. Is a black fox different from a red one? Smarter. Oh, might be. Has to be, maybe. A hunter will do anything to get something rare. Supper! Ooh, come on. I'm starving. Me too. I entered a new world where all the colors were brighter. I saw everything new. Waiting, hoping every day to see my black fox. I guess for the first time in my life, I'd found what my dad had talked about to me so much. A fierce desire to play. And the whole world seemed painted in new colors. And everything seemed to fly out of a story. I floated through the hot, hot days, perfectly, utterly happy. Her and me. We had a story to play out together. And I thought I could write that story just the way it would suit me. I was back up the creek, near the ruin of the old Bowden cabin, poking crayfish so they'd loosen their claws, not waiting for anything much, when she came out of some bushes, with a frog in her mouth, dead. And she sat it on the ground. And out of a hole in some rocks came a baby fox. He was tiny and woolly and red and had a stubby nose, not like his mom at all. And he fell on that old dead frog and gave it the fiercest fight I've ever seen in my life. While the black fox sat like a mom in the park, watching with a pleased kind of brightness in her face, grinning. Then there must have been some noise on the far side of the clearing. The black fox froze made a faint sound, and the baby fox disappeared into the den, carrying the frog. She ran off again. Later, I heard her bark deep in the woods, leading any danger away from her baby. Just one baby. I remembered Hazeline's story about Mr. Hunter and the raw chicken trap. Maybe that fox had been my fox's mate. Maybe this was the only cub she'd managed to get moved before Mr. Hunter arrived with his dynamite. Walking home in the dusk, I was deciding it was up to me to protect that cub and his mother. All up to me. Hazeline was on the veranda, as usual. But this time was different. I never saw it coming. The moment I thought had to be my very worst moment, swooping right out of the blue. 
Tommy, get your shorts on and let's take a swim. What? I said let's take a swim. Aren't you roasting? Not at all, no. How could I tell her I couldn't swim? Even Hazeline would despise me for that. My dad being the sports coach and all. Oh, come on! But when I dragged myself downstairs in my shorts like a man on death row, there she was with two black inner tubes. And in all my life, I never saw a more welcome sight. Floating in that tube in the dark, looking up at the stars, I felt I was at the center of the universe. If I was asked what I would change in the world at that moment, I would have said without hesitation, nothing. I'd found the den by accident, and I'd been entirely wrong about the worst moment in my life after all. But I didn't know that was all set to come next day, right on the heels of perfect happiness. I'd forgotten that accidents can go both ways. I don't know what I'll do if it doesn't rain. My skin is crawling. Fox got my turkey that was nesting by the Christmas trees. No! Yeah, took the turkey and the eggs. I think it got one of the hens last week, too. I'm not going to put up with it. I mean it, Fred. Once a fox gets started, he'll clean out the whole hen house. I know that. Maybe it wasn't a fox. Well? The heat's got you down. It is not the heat. Every summer you start hopping on about the heat. All right, it's not the heat. Let's go look, Tom. Come on, Hap. Would a fox take eggs, Uncle Fred? Uh-huh. He'll take eggs and hide them till he wants them. Where? You want to look? My hands were sweating, and I felt dizzy. We walked up the stream, with Uncle Fred pausing until he came to a place where he smiled, bent down, and scooped the sand with his hand. Eggs. Are they turkey eggs? Uh, winter storage. Looks like you and me are going to have to catch us a fox, Tom. Uncle Fred? Yes, son. Maybe that old fox is a hundred miles away by now. Well, tomorrow we'll go see. Come on, Hap. As we got back to the house, my nose started to run. Hazeline? I've got it ready for bed. Hazeline, just for a minute. I really need your help. I have to talk with you. Come on in. Hazeline. <laughs> she turned around. She must have been crying for hours. If she'd soaked her head in hot water for a week, it couldn't have looked worse. What's the matter? I'm not going to get married. You're not going to marry Mikey? No, Mikey's not going to marry me unless I lose 20 pounds. <laughs> then just lose the 20 pounds, Hazeline. I can't. I just can't. Hazeline, you know the black fox. No, I don't want to hear about any old foxes. <laughs> The mood of the whole house had curdled like milk in the sun. I didn't sleep that night, praying for a miracle. That the fox would read my mind and disappear. That it would rain and Aunt Millie would say, Thank God. I never mind about those old chickens. We've got plenty left. Or it would get even hotter, and Hazeline would sweat off 20 pounds in the night and say, I've been thinking. And I don't think we should harm that old fox if she's lost her bow already. I'll explain to Dad. And Uncle Fred would listen to Hazeline and say, Well, now, I don't shoot so well these days anyway. Should we go for a swim instead? But next morning... Don't let that boy get heat stroke out there. Hazeline not having breakfast? God, if one more thing happens in this house, I don't know what I'm going to do. I cannot stand one more thing. I cannot... I stood on the back steps waiting for Uncle Fred. He came out carrying a sack, a spade, and his gun, muzzled down. And I knew his hands had been over that gun so many times he could load, aim, and hit wherever he wanted blindfold. If it's uh, too hot for you, son... No. Uh, 
I want to come with you. Good. I think you'll enjoy it. Let's go. He found her tracks by the creek straight away. I knew then with a sort of tight feeling in the gut what it had taken me weeks to do, and I only did it by accident, would take him an hour or two, and it would be no accident. I did my best, even so. Fox must be in the woods. Well, maybe. Let's go there, then. Uh, don't be in too big a hurry. Let's look a bit. See? Hap thinks the fox is in the woods. I'm not looking for the fox. You're not? Mm-mm. I'm looking for the den. We walked on in the direction I'd feared. My shoulders ached. I felt sick. Suddenly... That was the fox. Every time I spoke, I had the feeling I was breaking a rule of hunting. Uncle Fred didn't bother to reply anymore. And only Hap was fooled like I'd been by her attempts to decoy. Uncle Fred moved closer and closer with every step to her den and her last cup. Here it is. Come see, Tom. The baby foxes will be in there. That was the only time he was wrong. It was one. One baby fox. I knew that. He didn't. Yet. As he began to dig, powerfully and slowly, I shut my eyes and pressed my fists on the lids. Behind them, the black fox came running toward me out of an orange sunburst through the green, green grass like the first time I saw her. Suddenly, I turned and saw her for real. I saw her for the last time, across the creek, yelping desperately for me and Uncle Fred to follow her. Uncle Fred didn't even stop digging. And then she disappeared. Yeah, here we are. Oh, just one. He's, he's dead already. No, he's just play-acting. His ma taught him to do that. Now hold the sack. We're taking him home to bait our trap. It never fails. This is the one bait a fox can't resist. Tom? You hungry? No. Hmm. It's the heat. You're all dressed up. <laughs> Mikey come around? Oh, who cares? Tommy, listen. All wild animals die in some violent way. It's their life. It's the way nature is. Sure. <laughs> He's biting the wires. I saw him. He's got tiny teeth, like needles. <laughs> There's going to be a storm. Mom will cheer right up. You'll see. Is your dad still on the porch? Uh-huh. Mom's had him to come in before he gets struck. God! No! Oh. Where? Miss. And here comes that boy for hazel eye, thank the Lord. Oh, come on in now, all of you. Fox will still be around tomorrow. Feel that breeze. Tom, come into bed now. I went asleep in my clothes. And then I was wide awake. The storm was making a hell of a racket, and the tree was beating at my window. I opened it. I took off my shoes and knelt on the windowsill. There was an enormous flash of lightning turning everything white. And I climbed out, out of the nearest branch. Circled the trunk with my arms and froze while the rain lashed at my face. Then I let myself sort of slip down the tree. When I landed, I ran to the cage. The baby fox was huddled in the corner. I saw him when the lightning flashed, watching me. Then I saw the saddest thing I ever want to see in my life. Lying on the ground in front of the cage in all this rain was a small, dead frog. So I knew his mom was somewhere near, watching me, not trusting me anymore, maybe hating me. I picked up a brick. 
I'm gonna get you out. The lock was an old one, and it opened at first band. The cub slunk to the door and yelped. I stood right back in the shadows. He jumped and ran to the bushes, whimpering as he ran. There was an immediate answer from the darkness, then... nothing but the swish of the rain in the orchard. In my mind, I could see them together, running side by side, under the trees, through the rain. Tom, Aunt Millie. Uncle Fred, Aunt Millie, I'm awfully sorry, but I've let the baby fox out of the cage. Why, that's perfectly all right. Don't you think another thing about it. You just come on into bed. I'll, uh, I'll get a towel for your hair. I'm sorry, Uncle Fred. You look down at me. And I knew he was seeing through everything I'd done. Every trick I'd try to pull. And looking at his face, I knew he was going to give me just the biggest dressing down about not playing on the team. About not shaping up. About not being a real boy. Finally, he cleared his throat. Never like to see wild things in a pen myself. And looking at his face... I knew if there was one person in the world who understood me at this moment, it was this man, who seemed such a stranger. Thanks, Uncle Fred. Heavens above, you get pneumonia. Your parents come to fetch you real soon. I'm uh, sorry about your turkey and your hen out, Oh, Sam. <laughs> bet you think I'm awful caring on the way I did? No. <laughs> it was the heat. Just don't think about it anymore. That fox and her baby are miles away by now. Yeah, that's one thing about a fox. He learns. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's starting to rain again. I do declare we are going to be flooded out. Well... How will it be to get home, Tom? Real good, I guess, Dad. Mm -hmm. Now tell me, how was the farm, really? Hmm? Not bad. I told you you'd like it. Oh, I loved it. I knew you would. Hi, Petey. Hi. Hey, you know what happened? What? That girl I used to copy off in math. Mary McGee? She started her dad's car by accident and totaled it in a tree. Is the tree okay? Tree's okay. Girl gets next week off school. Next week is test week. Girl wrecks car. Boy fails math exam. Hey, Tom, what was the worst smell on the whole farm? Only there's been this commercial about room deodorants. It says it's a scientific fact that you can get used to any smell in 150. Sometimes at night, when the rain is beating on my window and the air is clean, I see grass, deep green grass in the wind, and I see the black fox leaping. Five years since that summer, and I still hear her, above the rain, beyond the years. The Midnight Fox by Betsy Byers was dramatized by Judith Adams. Tom was played by Barky Wright. Petey Burkis by David Hallisey. Older Tom and Mikey by Matthew Reese. Mom and Aunt Millie by Buffy Davis. Dad and Uncle Fred by Stuart Milligan. And Hazeline by Tracy Wiles. All other parts were played by members of the company. The director was Gaynor McFarlane.